Hi, I'm Mike, and today we take a look at the fascinating history of barbed wire with the help of some of our friends at Beckard Fencing on our Wyoming Life. <laughs> So to me, there are a few things that make a ranch. I guess the big one, uh, probably the animals. You can't have a ranch without one or two or a couple hundred. You need land, and depending on where you are, you might only need a few hundred square feet or a few hundred, even thousands of acres. But once you start looking around, there is one thing that sets a ranch apart, something that makes it all possible in today's day and age, and those are these, fences. Fences to keep your animals in and not your animals out. Nothing fascinates me like a fence. In fact, we have over 26 miles of fence here on the ranch. And we always sit, like to say that behind every fence is a story, a story of a family and generations of families. Life, death, tragedy, and triumphs. But there is also the history of the fence itself. The history of barbed wire is a story of achievement, uh, the story of a very small invention that has a very interesting and sometimes bloody backstory. To help us along, I've invited our friend Keith from Beckart Fencing to fill in some of the blanks. Keith has just hit his 30 year anniversary with Beckart, and he's probably forgotten more about fence than we will ever know. But be sure to go down in the description and find the link for Beckart Fencing. I want you to head on over there and congratulate, link, uh, congratulate Keith on 30 years and uh, be sure to like and follow them and see what they're up to. Hey gang, welcome back to our Wyoming life. You know this guy, this is Keith from Beckart out here hanging out, out here on the range. We're really about probably six miles from the main ranch, pretty close to it. And uh, today we thought we'd come out and talk a little bit about the history of the barbed wire on the ranch and also talk a little bit about Beckart. Yes, yeah. Beckart's got a history that goes way, way back. Way That's back. Right. Um, right. Keith, you let's talk about your history to start with. Um, you've worked for Beckart for 30 years. Yes, this summer... The end of this summer will complete my 30 years with Beckhart. Wow, and you have had to see some pretty good transitions through yep. uh, the, the technology between, you know, in fence just in 30 years. For sure. Um, actually, the, the plant that I worked out of in Van Buren, Arkansas is where all the ag products in North America are made. Um, it was put there in 1976. Wow. And it was actually put there to, to service the eastern and western U.S., with barbed wire that's what it was originally there for and i mean that plant now makes strand it makes barb still makes barbed wire all the woven wires that we've been putting up on the ranch for for the last three years or so wow as we're out here um it's amazing you can see the the difference in technology even sure. through barbed wire and that's kind of what we're going to take a look at today um i don't know really anything about barbed wire uh except for you know that it's pointy and can keep yeah. animals in it's obviously had many different uses yeah. it started out as, as a cattle a way to keep cattle in but it's been used even in uh in warfare oh yeah um yeah. and had plenty of uses but uh this is what we're looking at now right in front of us this is actually what you call two point it's two barbed point. wire yes Let's it take is. a look uh this is uh this is an iowa twist two point it uh it has one bar wrapped around one wire and then it is twisted together and our namesake actually was Leo Leander Beckhart, and in 1880, he would flip a wheelbarrow up, upside down, and pull the wire across the wheel, hand weave it together, and put nails in it. And they had the same problem. They were trying wow. to keep sheep in out of the, out of the villages. Uh, about 15 years later in, in Europe, they started zinc coating. And when they started zinc coating, that started getting more longevity. But for you guys, I mean, this barbed wire is how old, Mike? Oh I mean, my gosh. You can, I'm, I'm 50 years probably yeah. been out here at least. Yeah. And uh, it, it's still doing its job. And if you look, it just, fence goes out of sight. I mean, it's just unbelievable. We think we've got it bad. You and I are out there building fence and we've got the skid steer and hydraulic post pounder. Somebody put all this in and right. it's still out here doing its job. Yeah, I you think- guys uh, are really arid. I mean, we're gonna take a look as we go along, but you know, obviously a lot of T posts have been placed in, sure. I think in place of old rotten wooden posts. Um, everybody always asks us, you know, where you're getting your posts from. Yeah. I think that a lot of times, even back, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, it was find a, find a tree limb <laughs> and shake it, you know, stick it in the ground and, and 
staple yeah. staple barbed wire to it. And all over the country, every area is different. Um, you know, more stock pressure, you need a better fence, of course, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, you go down south, south Texas, Gulf regions, things like that, you have to have premier coatings or they're replacing their barbed wire and their fences every five, six years. We talked about this earlier. This is one place where we're actually pretty lucky because we have such a high stocking yeah. rate here in Northeast Wyoming. We're 35 acres for a cow-calf <laughs> pair. They're not putting a lot of pressure on these no, fences. No, no. No, they, uh, they're up and, and they're still doing their job for sure. Mm -hmm, for sure. Let's take a little stroll around. I got something in the Gator I want to show you guys. Uh, we're going to cruise along here a little bit and take a look at some stuff, but I did bring this along with us. And this belonged to my father-in-law, Gilbert. This was actually... Uh, a uh, plaque with a bunch of different old, old, old uh, types of barbed wire on it. And these are uh, late 1800s, but a lot of these were probably made by hand too, Oh, correct? sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, some of these products that actually the barb has a hole through it. And I'm, I'm sure they didn't have technology at that time to insert that wire through that hole. <laughs> True. So they did, so they drilled the hole in that. Yeah. They probably cut it by hand. Yeah. Drilled the hole and then threaded it onto the wire while it was twisting. It, it's crazy. I mean, this... What you see, the two-point here, is pretty old, but that would have been when they started mass producing. Uh, mm -hmm. You couldn't mass produce most of these fences like this right. at, at that time, for sure. <laughs> so uh, this this technology is, is still in use. Um, Beckard has taken it a step further with the high tensile machines and, and things like that. But, um, you know, the high tensile machines are still, you've got high tensile steel wire, two strands woven together with a barb on the outside of it. Basically the same thing. There you go. All right, we're gonna go find you guys some, uh, some more fence to take a look at, and we're gonna take a look at some of those posts too. In the meantime, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the history of barbed wire. In 1862, Abraham Lincoln signs the Homestead Act, which gives each US citizen the right to claim 160 acres of public land. Like that, settlers are turned loose on the landscape. They begin moving west, but one of the first challenges they faced was drawing boundaries keeping people, crops, and livestock on their property or out of it. As you can see, there's not a lot of trees out here to harvest wood to build wooden fences like they were used to out in the east. And with more and more land needed for every head of cattle or horse or sheep, even if they could find the wood, it became too costly to try to fence in pastures for livestock. So some crafty settler began playing with the idea of wire a single strand of wire to hold animals where they needed to be. Of course, there's one major problem. If you put a piece of wire between a 1,400 pound cow and a nice green pasture, you probably aren't gonna have that piece of wire for too long. It didn't take long until people began thinking of solutions. And from 1867 to 1874, more than 200 patents were processed for some type of spiked or thorny fencing. Some had alternating spikes, Others, wooden boards, and some a combination of both, wooden boards with spikes driven through them. But it was a man named Lucian Smith who is said to have the, had the first working barbed wire prototypes. All right, we're back out here. Uh, this is a, a whole different part of the pasture. We're a little bit closer to home, and we're going to work our way back towards some new fence that Keith, what, you put in that fence last year? Um, it's been in two full years. Two full years. Yeah. Um, here we've got a kind of a different uh, different way to look at this because we've got different types of barbed wire here on the same strand right? or the same fence, and obviously we're back to this two-point that we talked about before, but down here, this is a whole different type of thing. Four-point. Four point. So you've got the same kind of twist and that barb will actually be placed on one wire and then it will be wrapped across and around both wires. So you see this more in the east. Okay. Two point will, or two points in the western U.S., four point is in the eastern U.S. More stocking pressure, more places for the animal to get poked and, and become, you know, aware of those fences and stay off of them. Gotcha. Um, I ran barbed wire for many years with Beckhart and, you know, probably eight, seven, eight years. And uh, you'd turn like 300 plus rolls a day. So anybody wants to try to do that math and figure out how, <laughs> if we can fence to the moon and back or not, you know. You probably could. Actually, that'd be a good thing to know. Yeah, why not? Let's put a fence up to the moon. Yeah. No doubt. But yeah, definitely interesting. I mean... Uh, we see some around our house, you know, in Western Arkansas, we see stuff like that. But uh, yeah, definitely different areas, four point uh, east of the Mississippi, 
in Two Point West of the Mississippi. I'm it's guessing since there's one strand in here, somebody just got it on sale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Threw yeah. it up here. Or that's what they had. That's what they had, yeah. no doubt. The problem with Smith's barbed wire is that it was mostly made by hand, and the making of thousands of miles needed to fence the West was just not feasible. So leave it to a farmer to come up with a solution for that problem. In 1874, a man from Illinois named Joseph Glidden won the barbed wire battle. Glidden made millions with his invention using a grindstone and a coffee mill to twist two wires together to hold a single barb in place. Repeat that over and over again, and his company was making three million pounds of barbed wire each year. With mass production came a fencing spree. Until then, the law of the land was open range. It ruled out west. Cattlemen were allowed to roam wherever they were content, and cowboys that drove cattle to sail could cross the land, finding ponds and rivers along the way and grass for grazing. As the fences went up, they restricted the movement of the cattle and the access to water and those pastures. Taking a look at some of the, the fence posts that we've got out here, and um, you know, we're very arid, very dry. We're actually considered high desert, but I mentioned earlier that sometimes it seemed like they just grabbed a, a tree limb and shoved it in the ground. And I don't know, this could be deterioration over time, or that thing could have looked just like that when they planted it. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, these are these are, these come from we plant these and hopefully we grow trees. Yeah, is what, we're, is what we're going for. But obviously, it's right next to a T post, so somebody figured out. Well, that's not doing a whole lot. Yeah, I mean that that T post doesn't have a whole lot of age on it, and <laughs> it hasn't went any further than that. I mean, that's a T post. That's that's what we use. And um, I'd say the biggest migration that we've seen over the past couple of years is from wood to steel. Really, um, you know. We've been using used oil field pipe ever since we started working with you guys, right? right. You you had some from methane that's been here, and and it's making a good fence. I mean, it doesn't go anywhere. That's no, for sure. No. And you get in, and if you brace it correctly, that's right. That's I think that's where you you know you even look at this. We've got really long runs, no H braces. You know, few few wood posts, but I don't see an H brace for yeah. a quarter mile. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. and maybe there should be one, especially when you're getting up and when you're changing elevations, right? Yeah, and a lot of it is a lot of it has to do with what kind of stocking density do you have. True. And I'm a I'm a firm believer. There's there's, you know, people on the market and they say this is the way you have to build a fence. You know, and I I don't truly believe that because I built fence in South Georgia, mm -hmm. I built fence in Spokane, Washington, now in Wyoming, all the way south to the to the Mexican border and to Canada. So I mean, I see different fencing techniques all over the country, and I just don't believe that there's one way to build a fence. Everybody needs their their method. So we should uh, make a T-shirt that says, <laughs> "There's more than one way to build a fence." That's right. There yeah. we go. Let's go take a look at some newer fence and uh, how it's been holding up for the last couple of years. Cool. Homesteaders now had a simple yet effective way to mark their boundaries and confine their animals, and the effect on the Great Plains was huge. Within just a few years, the age of the open range was over. Thousands and thousands of small homesteads were popping up all over the place, where ranchers were used to freely grazing their cattle. The old technique of driving cattle across the open countryside, it was, it was over, but not without a fight. Fence cutter wars broke out in Texas, Wyoming, New Mexico, Colorado, and Montana. By the 1880s, fenced livestock herds were overcrowding the larger cattlemen. Cattle barons began fencing off their lands along with public lands, limiting access to water. Homesteaders fought back by cutting their fences to give their livestock access to these lands. By the fall of 1883, amid drought, more than $20 million in damages had been done. In Texas, cutting a fence meant automatic prison time. Laws were changed requiring property owners to provide gates every three miles. And by the mid-1880s, the fence cutter wars were over. Fence cutter wars were the last attempt to keep the open range alive. Western settlement continued to grow. And along with the $20 million lost, three people were killed, including Texas Ranger Ben Warren. Now we see barbed wire as more of a convenience, but back then it was the sign of a new coming age in America. Barbed wire is cited by many historians as the invention that tamed the West and made a large number of cowboys unnecessary, in turn bringing about the end of the Old West era. Over the years, technology and fencing has changed a lot. 
from low tensile to high tensile, from steel to zinc and aluminum. There are barbed wire museums, competitions, even a barbed wire society. But all I know is we have a lot of it. And some of it thanks to Beckard Fencing and Keith's own blood and sweat. Well, guys, we're getting ready to wrap things up, but uh, Keith's time on the ranch is coming to an end once again. But you didn't have to work this time, so yeah. just go out and That's take rare a look around. I know, right? I, I should have prepared better. Yeah. Uh, we're up here at a fence that you guys put in, you and Steve put in. Two, we did. Two years Before ago. Before Steve retired, yeah. Uh, this was a brand new build. Uh, this actually was utilized during the drought right. uh, when we needed to graze this pasture. That's we had, right. We really had no way to do that. Yep. And uh, this fence, man, this still looks really good. Yeah. Uh, two point high tensile. 14 gauge Cattleman Pro. It's got a zinc aluminum coating and mainly Mike for you guys in these areas, it's maintenance, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you put in a new fence, you don't want to have to go work on it. The old fences that we saw, they're still up, they're still doing their job, but you're probably having to go through and you're having to make repairs. Oh, and yeah, stuff all the time, yeah. um, if you make the investment, you know, this is going to handle snow load. You had a huge blizzard this year. Mm -hmm. it, it's still upright. I mean, nothing is tore down. And no, look you know, how tight fence. that is. My God. <laughs> it's like playing a banjo. Yeah. Yep. But uh, that's what it's all about for you guys in this area. You're not going to need this zinc aluminum coating. Uh, you may not even have to have high tensile. But if you put a fence up like this, you can forget about it. You don't have to come back and maintain this fence over the next probably 30, 40 years. You're not going to have any problems. And this fence actually but is between us and Butch, our neighbors. So yep. As they say, good fences make, make good, good neighbors. neighbors. That's yeah, right. This is a great fence. I'm looking here. This is a little different profile uh, than, it is. than what uh, we were looking at back down there because the barbs went through the twist. This is actually a twist around type deal. That's right. This is ran through a high tensile machine. Okay. So on the old low carbon machines, all you get is what the spindle can turn. And that's all the wrap that you get. But if you look between these barbs, you've got four and a half to five and a half wraps. So you've got all that rigidity on that high tensile steel. So it's not going to stretch out over time. It will maintain its tension. As you go through the heating and cooling cycles, it basically has a little bit of elasticity. It mm -hmm. can work. You will, you will gain and you will lose two pounds for every degree of temperature change with steel. Wow. So that, that is a great fence. I, I'd be very surprised if you have to touch this fence anytime soon, uh, I don't unless we get a tornado. It. Yeah, <laughs> that, that could happen. The, uh, the, the science that goes behind fencing obviously is, is way more than either you or I will probably ever <laughs> yeah, understand. Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot smarter people than us out there that, that make this stuff work. It's just us that, uh, you got to put it up and got to put it you up. You got to sell it and, and we yeah. gotta, we gotta, we gotta make it work. This little trip has shown me a lot of miles of fence on the ranch. I'm telling you, yeah, no doubt, no <laughs> doubt. Well, thank you, Keith. I appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Uh, where are you heading? Are you heading back home? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna head back towards Denver and uh, then head home. Awesome. Well, thank you for visiting, man. Absolutely. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. That's a good looking fence, Keith. And 26 miles of fence here on the ranch is probably just a drop in the bucket to Keith, who has over 30 years. I guess he's probably seen a mile or two himself. While other barriers crumble, fall over, weather and age, wire simply rusts, and barbed wire keeps its sting. Not only is barbed wire what tamed the Wild West, it also enables us to feed thousands, controlling our herd, our lineage, and our product. And for that, we have the settlers who saw a problem and invented a solution to it to think. If you read some of the storybooks, You'd think Bob Wire Plum ruined the range country. Fact of the matter is, a good part of our job is keeping fences up in shape. You see, we're using Bob Wire to make the range country better. We keep the cattle off a different piece of it each year until the grass has made its seed and gotten a new start. Deferred grazing, we call it in the range program. Along with proper stocking, it's blue life into a lot of ranges. Good. It takes no room, exhausts no soil, shade, and no vegetation. It's immune to high winds, makes no snow drifts, as well as being durable and cheap. That's barbed wire, and it makes it possible to do exactly what we do. Congratulations, Keith, on 30 years at Backart. And while the thousands of miles of wire you've seen in your career may seem like a lot, it's nothing compared to the stories that are behind the fences you helped build. And I still have your glamour shots in our studio, so I can say, I knew him when. Thanks all of you for coming along today and learning a little bit about something that seems so small, but means a whole lot 
be sure to subscribe, follow along. We have a lot coming up from the ranch and if you don't wanna miss a thing, be sure to hit that little bell button and get notified whenever a new video comes out. Until next time, have a great week and thanks for joining us in our Wyoming life.